Here is Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and on. For I passed on to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as though to one born at the wrong time, he appeared to me also. This section is so well formed that many scholars believe it to be a quotation of an earlier widely used creed with a statement evidence format. So he died according to the scriptures. He was buried, evidence that he died. Then he was raised on the third day, again according to the scriptures, evidence he appeared to Cephas and all these other people. So a completely conventional resurrection story in which the evidence of the resurrection is the reappearance of the person after death. No mention of empty tombs or graves. A couple of decades after Paul wrote those lines, the author of Mark was putting together his gospel, and for some inexplicable reason, he doesn't use the conventional evidence that resurrection has occurred. Instead, he uses the much more tenuous evidence that the body of the dead person has disappeared. Here he is in Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought aromatic spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, at sunrise, they went to the tomb. They had been asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled back. Then, as they went into the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robes sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed, but he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, even Peter, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Then they went out and ran from the tomb, for terror and bewilderment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And that's it, the end of Mark's Gospel. Mark's scheme is fraught with difficulties. An obvious one being, how do you know that the body hasn't simply been stolen? And that, of course, led to all the complications in later Gospels of putting guards by the tomb, etc. Another problem is the women had to be pretty dim to set off with no means of opening the tomb. But perhaps there is a more obvious problem. How do people get to find out that the body has disappeared after it's been buried? What reason would they have to go and exhume it? Mark's scheme to work a missing body into the tale is highly contrived. Firstly, he has Jesus placed in a rock-cut tomb rather than being buried in the ground or cremated, and that is to make the body more accessible to visitors. And then the tomb is visited after death to give the opportunity for the visitors to discover that the body is missing. The pretext for visiting the tomb after death is an extremely weak one. It's a tortured version of a tradition of preparing bodies for burial with spices. This tradition did exist, and the reason that it existed was to diminish and disguise the odours of decomposition that followed death in hot climates. The same reason that burial is required shortly after death in hot countries, but there has never been a tradition to anoint or spice up a body once it's already been buried. That's completely pointless. And yet that's the plot device that Mark used. Why? Not only did he use that odd plot device, but he didn't include any post-death appearances at all. This was seen as such a serious omission that someone in the Middle Ages found it necessary to add a few forged verses at the end of Mark that described post-death appearances of Jesus. But well before that, the other Gospel writers included post-death appearances, though they still copied Mark's pericope of the empty tomb. The reliance of Mark on the empty tomb while not having any post-death appearances of Jesus is problematic. Not only because it's not the most obvious way of establishing that the resurrection had occurred, but also because if it's correct that Paul's passage is an earlier creed, then presumably the resurrection was well known as were post-resurrection appearances by Mark as well as by his audience, yet he doesn't mention it. By focusing on the fate of Jesus' body, Mark is taking a very different tack from Paul, who focuses not on the fate of Jesus' body, but on resurrection appearances 
and resurrected bodies being changed and raised incorruptible, etc. It's difficult to understand if the purpose of Mark was to persuade non-believers that Jesus was the Messiah. And it's also difficult to understand if the purpose of Mark was to convey a message of encouragement to existing believers. But there's one circumstance under which it's easy to understand, and that is if the purpose of Mark was actually to convert an existing group of mythicist Christians into historicists. Then Mark's omission of mentioning any post-death appearances is understandable because he's preaching to people who already believe in the resurrection. It looks as though Mark is telling us about the fate of Jesus' body because he has introduced us to some concept that begs the question, what happened to the body? Well, Mark tells us a lot of things in his Gospel, but the one thing he tells us that does seem to beg this question is that Jesus was a historical person, because the fate of the body is a thing specific to historical persons, and introducing a historicising narrative would require this issue to be dealt with. This explains something else as well. Why did the women not tell anybody? And don't say because they were afraid. The reason they didn't tell anyone was because Mark needed to explain why the events he was recounting were said to have happened 40 years previously, but his audience, who are Christians, hadn't heard of them. So to me at least, Mark's use of the empty tomb pericope is a fairly strong steer towards mythicism.